Good morning, everyone, and good morning to the Minister of Public Expenditure and Reform, Michael McGrath. There is no simple and ready roadmap out of the pandemic. The full consequences of what has happened over the past year in terms of human health and welfare in every dimension remain to be seen. Governments and policymakers across the world have been forced to experiment on a scale never seen before. This is likely to continue in the months and perhaps years ahead in the face of the extreme uncertainty generated by COVID-19. Over the next 20 minutes or so, Minister McGraw will discuss some of the challenges being faced and how the government and wider public sector will contribute to addressing them. We'll then go to a question and answer session with the audience. You'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see at the bottom of your screens. Feel free to send in your questions and comments throughout the session as they occur, and we'll come to them once Minister McGrath has finished his presentation. A reminder that today's presentation and Q&A are both on the record. Before handing over to the Minister, a brief biographical note. Uh, Michael McGraw was elected to the Aaron on his first attempt in 2007 and has been re-elected in, uh, in every election uh, since then. In his time uh, as a TD, uh, Michael has served on a number of our office committees, including the Finance Committee, the Office Banking Inquiry, the European Affairs Committee, and the Public Accounts Committee. As Minister for Public Expenditure and Reform, he oversees the implementation of the National Development Plan, drives the programme of public services reform, and has a key role in decisions made across government. Thanks again for joining us this morning, Minister, and over to you. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Dan, for the kind introduction and good morning, everyone. And I just want to start by uh, thanking your Director General and yourself, Dan, for uh, the invitation here this morning to speak virtually uh, to all of your members and guests. And it's a great uh, honour to have the opportunity of doing so. And um, I am delighted to, to join you here, albeit virtually, and I do look forward, hopefully, uh, in, in the months ahead to taking part in future events uh, in person uh, at Northgridge, Georgia Street. And I want to acknowledge uh, the role of the IIEA at the beginning. Uh, since uh, its inception 30 years ago, uh, you have played a leading role in providing a forum for discussion uh, and debate on the major international issues of the day. Uh, for sharing ideas uh, and also for shaping policy. Uh, and I do want to take this opportunity to pay tribute uh, to your late founder, Brendan Halligan, whose memory I know is being honoured with an essay competition uh, for third level students, uh, a group whose college experiences, of course, have had to adjust to uh, the restrictions brought about by uh, the pandemic. But I just want to acknowledge uh, the huge role of uh, the late Brendan Halligan uh, in terms of the IIA and indeed far beyond in relation to his reach. And this morning, I would like to just share with you my thoughts on the last 12 months briefly on the challenges we have faced and how we've responded to them both domestically and indeed as part of the international community and on the challenges, but also on the opportunities we face uh, in the coming period. Uh, I believe that yesterday's announcements from the government will prove to have been a very important stepping stone, a stone on the road back to normality. Uh, with over 800,000 vaccine doses now having been administered to date and during the second quarter of the year, uh, there will be a very significant ramping up of the programmes, uh, which will greatly assist in uh, the opening up of the country when that is appropriate. Uh, it is undoubtedly the case uh, that better days uh, are indeed ahead. Uh, in the past year, two critical issues, of course, have dominated the policy landscape within which we are all operating. Uh, the first is COVID, of course, and its impact on society uh, and on the economy, as well as the consequences that this has had for public expenditure. Uh, the second is Brexit, where our focus was on mitigating the risks of a no trade deal scenario uh, and is now on deepening our relationship with the post-Brexit UK and fostering uh, North-South relations. However, before the pandemic arrived, uh, there were already very significant domestic policy challenges facing us, uh, and these remain, and will come back centre stage on the policy agenda, uh, I think, quite shortly. Uh, in the Programme for Government, Our Shared Future, we have set out these challenges in terms of missions. Uh, for instance, universal healthcare, addressing climate change, tackling homelessness and delivering affordable home ownership and building stronger and safer communities. 
as part of budget 2021, uh, core current expenditure will grow, will grow by 3.8 billion euro, or just over uh, 6% compared to the allocation in 2020. Uh, and this increase is primarily driven by an additional uh, 1.9 billion for the health sector to address capacity issues and to enable the health service to better meet the needs of our citizens during the pandemic, but also beyond, because we're increasing the permanent capacity of our public health system. Uh, and this considerable investment in public services is complemented by a new two-year pay agreement uh, called Building Momentum uh, with the public sector. The agreement acknowledges the contribution the public service has made uh, in the most difficult of circumstances during the pandemic. Uh, the deal is fair, uh, affordable and sustainable, and it does recognise uh, the huge economic challenges currently facing the country. Outside of core expenditure commitments, uh, there are a number of supports relating to the COVID response that are reflected in departmental estimates. Uh, these costs amount to six and a half billion euro and include 3.2 billion in social protection payments and 1.9 billion to support the health service in response to COVID. So these are direct COVID costs that we have allocated additional budgets uh, to the respective departments. In addition, there is also over 5 billion in contingency funding, which we have prudently set aside and which we're going to need uh, over the next number of months to meet the further expenditure commitments uh, as they arise in the context of COVID. Uh, by the end of this year, uh, my department estimates that we will have incurred up to 28 billion euro in direct COVID related expenditure over 2020 and 2021. Uh, as a result of these measures, a general government deficit of 19 billion euro or nearly five and a half percent of GDP uh, is estimated as the final outturn for 2020. A 21 billion euro swing from 2019, a deficit of a similar size uh, is expected again in 2021. It, it is entirely appropriate that we have acted to support the economy in these circumstances, and this has been greatly assisted by the approach taken by the European Central Bank uh, in its response to the pandemic. The ECB's Pandemic Emergency Purchase Program uh, is a truly eye-popping 1.85 trillion euro and stands in sharp contrast to the initial response to the global financial crisis of over a decade ago. This has helped to lower borrowing costs for uh, Eurozone countries. Uh, as a government, we are committed to restoring the public finances to a sustainable trajectory and ensuring that Ireland does not become an outlier as we emerge from the pandemic period. In this regard, the stability programme update will set out uh, some economic and fiscal uh, forecasts uh, for the period ahead, and this will be published uh, next month uh, in April. The summer economic statement will offer the opportunity to present a more informed strategic view of the public finances. By that stage, the vaccination programme will have advanced very significantly. The impacts of the UK's departure from the single market uh, will be better understood and the full effect of COVID on the public finances uh, will be more complete. As the Minister for Public Expenditure, I recognise the critical importance of building up our national infrastructure. Uh, this year, total expenditure and capital programmes will amount to a record 10.8 billion euro. And as set out in the programme for government, a review of the national development plan is currently underway. And this will allow the government to take account of the COVID crisis, to reflect priorities in the program for government and to strengthen the alignment with the national planning framework and to link with the latest climate action plan and other sectoral policies. In addition, the uh, development of the national economic recovery plan is now uh, very well advanced. As it becomes possible to ease restrictions in response to uh, improving public health, the government will outline how we will help people to return to work and support sectors which have been disproportionately affected by the pandemic. As noted in the government's policy on rural development, uh, Our Rural Future, published earlier this week, an unparalleled opportunity now exists to realise the objectives of balanced regional and rural development and to maximise recovery for all parts of the country. Uh, the move to remote or connected working underpinned by the rollout of the National Broadband Plan has the potential to transform the way we live and work.
At a European level, of course, the 750 billion euro next generation EU recovery instrument, along with the EU's budget, the MFF, for the next seven years, uh, is central to the Union's response to the global pandemic. Uh, the aim of next generation EU is to help repair the immediate economic and social damage uh, brought about by the pandemic and to prepare for a post-COVID Europe that is greener, more digital, more resilient, and fit to face the future. Uh, Ireland is expected to receive around 900 million euro in grants under the EU's recovery and resilience facility this year and next year. And a further set of grants is to be allocated in 2023, taking account of economic developments between now and then. Uh, in order to access this funding, uh, we must develop a national recovery and resilience plan for approval by the European Union. And my department, working uh, together with the departments of Antishuk and Finance, is responsible for pre preparing this plan uh, with input from other departments as well, and for ensuring coordination across government. At a political level, development of the plan is being overseen by the Cabinet Committee on Economic Recovery and Investment, while Minister Donoghue and I also met uh, Economy Commissioner Paolo uh, Gentiloni last week. Uh, we set out for the Commissioner our ambitions for the recovery and resilience facility and our priorities for Ireland's plan. We will be continuing that dialogue uh, after Easter uh, and we'll submit uh, our final plan uh, next month in April. I can confirm that Ireland's plan will have a particular focus on green and digital transition, as well as supporting economic recovery and job creation. Like all national plans, it must also strike a balance between reforms and investments and seek to address challenges identified in relevant country specific recommendations received by Ireland in 2019 and last year, which arise as part of the European semester process. Turning briefly to Brexit, I'm sure we all welcomed in broad terms the conclusion of the EU trade and cooperation agreement at the end of last year. And I do want to pay tribute, as I know you have done, to the EU's chief negotiator, uh, Michel Barnier, for his achievement, as well as for his constant uh, support for Ireland. The trade and cooperation agreement, together with the withdrawal agreement, including the protocol on Ireland and Northern Ireland, means that our key Brexit objectives have been achieved. Specifically, they protect the Good Friday Agreement and the gains of the peace process, including avoiding a hard border on the island of Ireland. In circumstances where the UK has decided to leave the EU, it ensures the best possible outcome for trade and the economy, notably tariff and quota free trade with the UK and the protection of Ireland's place at the heart of the EU single market. But let us not forget, there's no such thing as a good Brexit. These new arrangements are suboptimal and the full implications of the UK's departure from the EU remain to be fully revealed, uh, but clearly will be and are already significant. Uh, it is the government's view that unilateral actions on the protocol are destabilizing and must be avoided. We have always been clear that we want the protocol to be implemented sensitively in a way that impacts as little as possible on communities in Northern Ireland. As regards East-West trade, we need to remember uh, that the TCA does not replicate the status quo. There are now checks and controls for goods moving to and from and through Great Britain. Seamless trade, unfortunately, uh, no longer exists. And this is why the government has been working to prepare for Brexit for several years. Our total Brexit-related expenditure since the UK referendum on EU membership is now uh, over a billion euro. We've invested significantly in infrastructure, systems and staffing at Dublin Port, Rosslare Europort and Dublin Airport to ensure the east-west trade can continue with as little disruption as possible. The UK government has announced that it, it will postpone the introduction of new UK import controls that had been scheduled for April 1st and July 1st. And these new changes are only postponed, however, not cancelled. Exporters must ensure that everyone in the supply chain, including the UK importer, is clear on their roles and responsibilities and can meet them. A range of government supports are available, including training and grants to help businesses to deal with these challenges. The EU's Brexit Adjustment Reserve uh, represents an important response by the European Union to the challenges posed by the UK's departure from the EU. Uh, Ireland has played a leading role in securing support for the reserve at the Marathon European Council meeting uh, in July of last year. It's generally acknowledged 
that Ireland is the member state most impacted by Brexit. And so we remain, we, and we expect to be a significant beneficiary uh, of this reserve. Uh, for Ireland, relevant areas for assistance from the reserve will include um, enterprise supports, supports for the agri-food sector, fisheries, reskilling and retraining, uh, and infrastructure for the ports and airport. Ireland's view is that the Commission's proposed allocations are appropriate and fair, and that they are in line with the solidarity envisaged by the European Council. We hope that agreement on this proposal can be concluded quickly so that the funding can start to flow. One area of cross-border cooperation I'd like to briefly highlight is the special new Peace Plus programme that will build on the and continue the important work of successive peace and interreg programmes. For more than a quarter of a century now, uh, these programmes have made an enormous contribution to cross-border cooperation, and remain important drivers of regional development in a cross-border context. Uh, more than that, the programs have been a key element of the EU's continuing commitment to the process of peace building and reconciliation and support for the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, but we understood that Brexit could not mean the end of this work. Indeed, Brexit made it even more imperative that it continue. So we proposed what has now become Peace Plus, and the new programme will address the themes of building peaceful and thriving communities, uh, delivering economic regeneration and transformation, empowering and investing in our young people uh, in the border counties and in Northern Ireland, healthy and inclusive communities, and supporting a sustainable future. Uh, on the 10th of March, uh, the special EU programmes body launched, a, which is a cross-border body, launched a public consultation on the draft framework for the new program. This will run until the 12th of May, and I would encourage anyone interested in the program to take part in that. The final allocation for the program remains to be agreed in discussions between the EU and the UK, and I look forward uh, to that happening as soon as possible, so that the important work supported by Peace Plus uh, can get underway. And uh, all of the indications are that we will have a very substantial fund uh, of the order of 1 billion euro as well as significant funding from uh, Peace Plus. Budget 2021 uh, announced the Shared Island Fund with a planned 500 million euro uh, to be made available out to 2025. The fund provides significant new multi-annual capital funding for investment on a strategic basis in uh, collaborative North-South projects that will support the commitments and objectives of the Good Friday Agreement and will help us to reach the full potential uh, of the all-island economy. As we move, move through the pandemic and deal with the consequences of Brexit, we must also look to the future. And that is why the Programme for Government sets out a vision of Ireland at the heart of Europe and global citizenship. Uh, the lifetime of this government will see Ireland mark uh, 50 years of EU membership. Our membership has played an immense role in Ireland's social, economic and political development in the intervening five decades. The values of the European Union are our values. Within my own department's area of responsibility, Ireland has been a significant beneficiary of cohesion spending, which will be one of the primary instruments available to the Union in the years ahead, as we respond to and move beyond the pandemic. Ireland will receive more than 1 billion euro in cohesion funding under the 2021 to 27 programming period. And this funding will be spent in areas such as supporting SMEs, reskilling and upskilling our workforce, and that will be so needed uh, after COVID, and investing in research and development and emerging technologies, and to ensure that we are well placed to take advantage of opportunities arising from a green and a digital Europe. This May will see the launch of the Conference on the Future of Europe that will conclude during the French Presidency of the Council in the first half of 2022. The conference is intended to give citizens a greater voice and greater involvement in the future direction of the Union. It represents an important opportunity to focus on the issues facing the Union, protecting its citizens, their health and their freedoms, developing a strong and vibrant economic base to drive the recovery, promoting green and digital transition, and promoting European interests and values on the world stage. And we all will need to play our role in being advocates for that. The last 12 months have thrown up many challenges for the EU, and it's important the Union learns from those challenges. But we also know that even in difficult times, Ireland has benefited 
from the solidarity that EU membership has provided. Our membership of the union has been characterized by a very significant contribution by Irish people to the work of the EU institutions. As we approach our 50th anniversary, it is important that that continues. And that is why my department is working with Minister Thomas Byrne and his team on the development of a new strategy to increase the presence of Irish people in the ranks of the EU institutions. I regard this work as a priority. We also need to deepen our relationship with our nearest uh, neighbour post-Brexit. While Brexit provides a new context, the ties between our two islands remain strong and the connections remain close. And we have a shared responsibility to protect the spirit and indeed the letter of the Good Friday Agreement. Strengthening bilateral relationships with the United States is also a key target for Ireland as set out in the Programme for Government. Uh, our relationship with the US is built on a deep foundation of ancestral ties and decades of close political, diplomatic and economic links. The inauguration of President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris marks a new chapter in that relationship. And I'm delighted that in the midst of the pandemic, 2021 has still seen Ireland take its place at the UN Security Council for the fourth time since we joined the UN in 1955. As a small country, but one with a global diaspora, it is important we contribute to the Security Council's mandate to maintain international peace and security in an often troubled world. And we have so much to offer in that regard. Finally, I would like to reiterate that over the last decade or so, Ireland has made a number of significant changes to ensure that the Irish taxation code is in line with new and emerging international standards uh, as agreed globally. Um, it does concern me when I see some critics continue to focus on issues that have been addressed and that belong to the past. And I would ask people to acknowledge the reforms that we have undertaken as a country in relation to our corporation tax code and a positive role that we continue to play at OECD and EU level in addressing tax challenges that arise from digitalization and indeed from globalization as well. Uh, but I will conclude on an optimistic note. Um, the past 12 months have been truly extraordinary. Uh, there have been many dark days and there will be more ahead yet as we emerge from this pandemic. But never before in history has mankind united across the globe uh, in such a shared effort to respond to a shared threat, to take on the virus and to beat it. And never have we been better placed to do that. So I look forward to a time when the crisis will be in the past and that historians will conclude that we rose to the challenge, that we learned the lessons and we emerged in a better place. And we are confident that the Irish economy uh, is going to recover. Uh, we see a significant recovery getting underway in the second half of this year, and that recovery will gather momentum uh, over the course of 2022 and, uh, and beyond. And this government will do all that it can uh, to support, encourage, facilitate, and bring about that economic recovery and help our people to return to work as soon as it is safe to do so. So thank you so much, Dan, for the opportunity of setting out those um, uh, broad opening remarks, and I very much look forward to our, our discussion over the course of the Q&A. Thank you. The kind words about the Institute and our, our much missed uh, former colleague, uh, Brendan Halligan, uh, uh, that, that was appreciated. Uh, lots of questions, uh, lots of issues to get through. The first question that came in was um, on the uh, national recovery plan and the submission of each of the member states of the, the recovery plans to the European Commission. Um, could you give a little more, I know you mentioned the focus on green and digital for that plan, uh, any more thoughts and, and detail on that and maybe what the, what the dynamic amongst the member states is, each of the, the there's clearly last year when the idea of an expanded budget was put forward, there were, there were big differences between the member states on whether that should happen. Um, Maybe some thoughts on how that, uh, that, that that's evolving, the relationships uh, amongst the member states on an expanded budget and how money is spent, money that's raised by the EU institutions is spent by national governments. Sure, thanks, Dan. So in Ireland's context, uh, it is 
a relatively modest amount of money uh, in the way that it was uh, originally agreed. It is anchored in 2018 prices. In 2018 prices, it is 853 million euro in tranche one. Um, that's over 900 million euro in today's terms. Uh, and in overall uh, terms, we expect to receive close to uh, a billion euro. Uh, under the uh, recovery and resilience facility in the form of grants. And because this is uh, money coming from the European Union, uh, it is underpinned, of course, by regulations and is subject to all of the normal uh, checks and controls that, are, uh, that relate to uh, EU spending. Uh, there is a requirement for at least 37% of uh, the proposals uh, to relate to the digital space um, and in relation to uh, the, the green, it's 37 and 20% respectively in relation to, to green and digital. And uh, also you have to ensure that there's a balance between reforms uh, and investments. And as you would expect the European Commission uh, to avail of the opportunity also to seek progress in relation to uh, country specific recommendations uh, for the different member states. So we have engaged internally within government uh, with all of the government departments at this point and they've made various um, proposals to us. Uh, we have distilled those down into a defined set of projects at this point, and we have shared those with the European Commission, uh, and we're uh, receiving their feedback, and we will finalise that uh, and make the final submission uh, in the month of April. Uh, so in the digital space, for example, uh, we're very keen to uh, use the fund to accelerate uh, the digitization of public services. And um, we've seen a lot of progress in that regard in recent times. Uh, we see a uh, great opportunity in the e-health space, for example, uh, as we move to implement Slauncha Care uh, and modernize our health system. Uh, there are great opportunities to um, invest in IT, to invest in e-health, and that will be uh, a key part of it as well. Uh, in relation to uh, green uh, transition, uh, there are a range of important projects there uh, that are being put forward, uh, including in relation to sustainable transport uh, and active travel, uh, in relation to uh, our rail system, our bus system, uh, in relation to uh, the retrofitting uh, of uh, public buildings, for example. Uh, so a lot of transformative projects projects uh, in that space and also in relation to uh, research, science and innovation um, because we're very keen on the recovery aspect of uh, the new national recovery uh, and resilience plan. So there will be significant uh, allocation in the area of, of reskilling and upskilling and making sure uh, that we continue to promote uh, the research and innovation agenda uh, in line with the setting up of uh, that new government department, of course, uh, last year. So um, we expect to conclude our engagement with the European Commission uh, shortly. Uh, they are, as you would expect, placing a keen emphasis on uh, reforms and for some other Eurozone countries, of course, the, uh, the, the quantity of funding uh, is much, much greater than what Ireland is getting, uh, but nonetheless, uh, the EU is applying the same standard in respect of their engagement uh, with all countries. So the work is going well. Uh, it will make an important contribution, um, but it is in the context of, for example, when you compare it to our national development plan, where this year we have funding of almost 11 billion in the public cap capital program. So I think the scale of it should be seen uh, in that context. It will make a contribution. We will use it to drive uh, the, some of the reforms uh, in the green and digital space uh, in particular. And just to follow up on that, your, your sense of how the, the other member states will, will look at all of the other member states' plans. Um, do, do you foresee discord in, on, uh, in that area? Um, yeah, we're, we're, we are getting feedback on uh, the exchanges and the engagement between the Commission and other member states. And because the quantum of money being made available by way of grants to some member states uh, is very large uh, in the tens of billions of euro, uh, as you would expect, the uh, EU uh, is looking for structural reforms. And there isn't always a great welcome uh, in member states for structural reforms uh, to be implemented. Uh, and of course, in, in Ireland's case, 
uh, there are country specific recommendations uh, in the reform space as well. Um, but a, a number of those are already reflected in the programme for government uh, and are already being implemented uh, in the course of government work. Uh, others are under examination uh, by uh, different commissions and, and review bodies. So uh, I think uh, you will see the EU uh, understandably use the opportunity uh, to bring forward reforms in different countries. Uh, but in Ireland's case, uh, we have demonstrated uh, already that we're making very significant progress on our country specific recommendations uh, through uh, the emphasis, for example, uh, on a public house building program, uh, on uh, affordable housing, uh, and indeed in, in so many areas where uh, if you look at our 2019 and 2020 CSRs, uh, we believe that the new program for government um, it ticks many of those boxes and if you take the whole climate action agenda for example with uh, the new legislation the new climate action plan uh, very ambitious uh, legally binding targets now uh, then i think ireland has demonstrated uh, its commitment to uh, implementing the reforms that are set out in the csrs we have, on that very topic, the ambassador of the Netherlands, Adrian Palm, asks, says, thank you for your broad overview, Minister. Um, he also, his question is, which of the country specific recommendations will be the most difficult, painful to include in the government's proposals to the Commission? Well, it's not possible to uh, address all of the country specific recommendations in the submission because if you look at the requirements that we have to comply with in the context of this fund, uh, we have the uh, overall emphasis on green, uh, on digital, uh, on investments uh, and on reforms. And then there are multiple pillars as well uh, within that uh, that you have to seek to address. And then we have a whole range of country specific recommendations. And we want to have uh, quite a small number of projects that will be impactful. If we spread you know, less than a billion euro across uh, a very large number of projects, uh, then the impact will be greatly diluted. And I think we want to use this fund on a relatively small number of projects so that the impact can be meaningful uh, and measurable. Uh, so uh, when we look at our country specific recommendations, uh, they have one, for example, in relation to pension reform. And uh, we know that that was a huge issue in the general election last year, but we have been able to show the commission uh, that we have set up uh, a pensions commission now, uh, which is going to report uh, at the end of the next quarter, uh, actually, and uh, public consultation, as you know, has now closed and they will make uh, their analysis available to us and the government will make decisions uh, based on that. Uh, similarly, in relation to taxation reform, uh, which is also a country specific specific recommendation. Uh, as you know, Minister Donoghue has public published an update to uh, Ireland's uh, roadmap uh, in relation to corporation tax. Uh, and we've implemented so many reforms uh, in recent years and continue to engage in a very positive manner uh, through the OECD BEPS process. And we know there is now a renewed impetus there uh, with a view to reaching agreement in the middle of this year uh, in relation to the taxation of digital companies across pillar one and pillar two. Uh, and so we're playing a constructive part uh, in relation to those discussions and we think that the best way uh, to address that issue uh, is uh, in a multilateral forum uh, through agreement at the OECD. Uh, so uh, very many of the CSRs then are actually being addressed uh, in the context of the Programme for Government, uh, which has been adopted, uh, measures brought forward in Budget 2021. So, uh, and this is the point we would have made to Commissioner Gentiloni last week, that in the context of the, the quantum of funding we have, uh, you know, we can only do so much in relation to the national recovery and resilience plan we don't want to have dozens and dozens of projects and um, getting very small amounts of money uh, that make little or no tangible difference we want it to be impactful and to make a difference uh, but we will clearly demonstrate to the commission uh, the progress that we're making uh, on our country specific recommendations while at the same time addressing the primary objective of the recovery and resilience plan which is about recovery from COVID, 
uh, uh, with the emphasis on green, on digital, on reforms, on investments. So uh, it is about an overall balance, but we're confident uh, that we will have a final plan that meets the requirements of the Commission uh, and it will ultim ultimately be approved and we can draw down the funding. Uh, you, you raised the issue of corporation tax both just now and in your in your presentation, and it detected maybe a little bit of exasperation in terms of um, other member states not acknowledging some of the changes that have been brought in. In general, how, how would you characterize the views of other member states on Ireland's corporation tax regime and how they've changed over time, how those views have changed? In other words, has it become uh, less of an issue? Has it become more of an issue? Or does it remain, uh, particularly for some member states, um, uh, an issue for them? Um, and more specifically, if that multilateral BEPS process for uh, global corporation tax reform doesn't work out, uh, many EU member states want action at an EU level if, if it fails. What are your thoughts on, on that if the BEPS process doesn't deliver an outcome? Well, first of all, I think it's important to say that the, the certainty that uh, this government and now all of the main political parties in Ireland um, have adopted in relation to our corporation tax rate is a really valuable tool in our inward investment offering. Uh, the 12.5% corporation tax rate uh, is here to stay. It is the bedrock of our foreign direct investment strategy alongside all of the other uh, elements, including um, a very well-educated labor force, continued investment uh, in research and development, commitment to the European Union, uh, and so many other uh, aspects of that overall offering. And, you know, I think if we're to be uh, honest, uh, Ireland is viewed with a degree of envy uh, across the European Union because of the remarkable success uh, that we continue to have uh, in foreign direct investment. And, you know, we strongly argue that that is because of uh, the full uh, range of elements uh, in the offering uh, that we provide. Uh, we have an open and transparent corporation tax code, uh, which is embedded uh, in legislation. And uh, we are committed to playing our part uh, in the international examination of how we can improve uh, the taxation of digital companies. It is our strong preference that it would be done through the OECD. And I think the renewed commitment of the US administration now under President Biden uh, to that process uh, is particularly welcome. Uh, in the absence of that happening, then uh, it is, of course, possible that individual member states, uh, uh, through perhaps the enha enhanced cooperation instrument, uh, would seek to uh, proceed. But I think that would, would be less effective uh, than countries acting collaboratively. So uh, all of the indications are that there is a degree of confidence that agreement can now be reached uh, at the OECD uh, in the middle of this year. Uh, it will represent the challenge for Ireland. And as you know, we have uh, already quantified what the potential impact could be uh, on our corporation tax receipts uh, of some changes that might be adopted. But nonetheless, it is still in Ireland's interests that an agreement would emerge from that process. Uh, and that is why um, Minister Donoghue, uh, his officials uh, are investing a lot of time uh, and resources in playing a positive role in bringing about uh, those uh, changes, which uh, I think would be in everyone's interest overall. Because if individual countries seek to go off and do their own thing, I think it will be easier for large corporates to, to work around that. It's much more difficult for them to work around uh, a cohesive collective action uh, on a truly global scale. And I think only the OECD offers the potential to do that. So uh, we're very much hopeful that it will work. Well, we're on the, the subject of uh, uh, foreign direct investment and, and the crucial role it plays in the Irish economy. Do you see a possibility of the working from home phenomenon uh, being a threat to, to foreign direct investment? Could, could companies, just as you mentioned, there could be opportunities for regions, uh, particularly uh, rural regions, to take advantage of, of the change in work practices. Equally, could corporations decide that they don't need to have as large, these large hubs that have been based in Ireland, and that could actually result in, in less uh, multinational activity in Ireland? Yeah, I think it is uh, an evolving issue. And it is one that we will have to uh, carefully monitor. 
the impact of COVID and the uh, likely emerging hybrid form of working that we're going to see uh, post COVID is going to have an impact on so many levels. Uh, domestically, I think it will have an impact on uh, you know, where people are working. Uh, it has the potential to provide a fill up to the efforts at balanced regional development, allowing more people to work in towns and villages, whether it be in remote working hubs, uh, in communities, or indeed in their own homes. So there's very significant potential there. Uh, and the National Broadband Plan is now very much up and running. We've asked National Broadband Ireland to seek uh, to explore all of the avenues for accelerating that. Uh, in the context of the international investment environment, uh, it is also a factor. Uh, we want companies who uh, invest in Ireland uh, to uh, demonstrate a clear commitment to uh, this country by having the strongest possible presence in Ireland uh, with physical facilities and with key decision makers operating uh, in our jurisdiction. Um, it may well be the case, of course, that for some of them, uh, the ability to, to share their time is also going to be a feature in relation to being in Ireland for some of the time uh, and working from abroad. So it is an issue uh, that we will need to monitor, uh, but insofar as possible, you know, we want the key decision makers to be based here, uh, because I think that uh, embeds and secures uh, investment for the long term, uh, because we all know that when you have uh, the central decision makers in an organization uh, rooted uh, in this country, uh, then it gives us a great advantage when it comes to uh, investment decisions. And I think it demonstrates a commitment from those uh, companies to Ireland as well. Uh, so it is an issue that both the IDA and of course the revenue in the context of the workout of our taxation system uh, will be uh, monitoring on an ongoing basis uh, and we'll be working with uh, all of the stakeholders, the American Chamber uh, and indeed others uh, to see uh, what role we can play as a government uh, to bring about uh, the greatest commitment possible uh, to keep people basing themselves uh, in Ireland for as much of their time as is possible. I might ask you about the hot topic of strategic autonomy in the EU in, in a while, but just before that, two specific questions on the Brexit Adjustment Reserve. Anne Lanigan asks about uh, business supports in, that, uh, in the Adjustment Reserve, and the Belgian ambassador, uh, Pierre-Emmanuel de Bol, asks, uh, let me read this one. Um, can you tell us more about the government's position with regard to the compromise proposal of these presidency that would actually reduce the allocation to countries most affected by Brexit and your views on the way ahead in order to rapidly reach a decision? So two on the Brexit reserve. Um, yeah, well, we believe that the allocation key proposed by uh, the Commission uh, late last year represents a, a fair and a balanced allocation of what is a limited resource. Uh, I think it is widely accepted that Ireland is the country most impacted by uh, Brexit, uh, and that is why in those proposals, Ireland uh, is in line to receive about 25% of tranche one, uh, so in the region of uh, a billion euro. Uh, and we are seeking to defend that proposed allocation uh, because we think it is uh, the fairest way of doing it. Uh, and also it should be seen alongside uh, the agreement that Ireland signed up to uh, in the context of the recovery and resilience facility. Because, of course, there will be many who argue uh, that, um, uh, that Ireland uh, could have received more under that. Uh, we have supported uh, the rights of other member states to receive large allocations under the recovery and resilience facility uh, because of the allocation key that was agreed in respect of economic performance and how that uh, inputs into the formula. Uh, and similarly, when it comes to uh, the Brexit Adjustment Reserve, uh, we do not support uh, changes that have been proposed um, because Ireland uh, is the most impacted country. And that brings me to the second uh, question about enterprise supports. Uh, there will be scope uh, for enterprise supports in the context of the Brexit Adjustment Reserve. It will be 
uh, it will be targeting the sectors that are the most impacted. Uh, the most impacted sector is, of course, uh, the fishery sector uh, because of the change in the quotas arising from the deal, uh, but also the wider food sector uh, and exporters who are impacted by uh, non-tariff barriers. So we are working through uh, different uh, uh, scenarios and will be agreeing a package once we have certainty about what the allocation is for Ireland, uh, we will be uh, publishing uh, details of the enterprise supports and my department is working with the Department of Agriculture, Food um, and the Marine and also, of course, the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Employment uh, in relation to the specific details of those allocations, but we can't confirm those until we know exactly what we're going to get, but we are operating at the moment uh, on the basis of um, the allocations proposed by the European Commission, which we hope now are going to be uh, approved by member states so that we can all begin to benefit from this funding uh, as quickly as possible. On the subject of business supports, um, any sort of time frame you have in mind about phasing them out, and particularly in terms of, you know, if the new normal after uh, uh, provided the vaccines work means there's just less demand for hospitality, conference, just those sort of consumer uh, facing businesses. Um, will there be difficult decisions to make about phasing out and, and accepting that not every business will survive and uh, that, that those supports are going to have to be withdrawn and possibly quite quickly? Yeah, well, I'd, I'd like to acknowledge that any phasing out of these supports uh, will be difficult um, and it will happen uh, in the future, but it will be done in a careful and a gradual way. So we have committed that all of the supports currently in place will remain there uh, at the current rates for another full quarter uh, up to the end of June uh, and well in advance of the end of uh, quarter two, uh, we will signal what our plan is for beyond that because we do recognize uh, just how valuable those supports are and any uh, rapid or sudden uh, reduction or removal of those supports would simply result in uh, a lot of the employees currently being paid in part through uh, the employment wage subsidy scheme being let go and transferring onto the PUP. And so we need to think very carefully about that transition uh, and ensure that as we taper off the supports over time, uh, that is done in a very sensitive and gradual manner. I think it is too early to, to write off certain sectors and certain businesses. I think businesses that were uh, viable up to a year ago deserve the benefit of the doubt. Uh, undoubtedly, our experience of COVID over the last 12 months uh, will have accelerated certain trends and certain changes in uh, consumption patterns uh, in the way that we, we purchase goods and services. Uh, and I think that picture is evolving and will re reveal itself further uh, over the months ahead. Uh, but what we outlined yesterday, I think, is a sensible roadmap for uh, the gradual reopening of the country over the months ahead. Uh, I do think that by uh, by midsummer, certainly by getting uh, to, to July, uh, we will have uh, the prospect of a summer that was very similar to last year, uh, where we had a lot of freedoms and we were able to, to spend time uh, in different parts of the country and avail of hospitality uh, and do all of the things that people like to do we have a journey to get there uh, and that's why it has to be gradual and it has to be very carefully managed uh, so i think that some of the supports that we have in place will be with us for some time uh, perhaps in a different manner uh, one of the key issues that has been raised with us is the fact that you know, depending on what side of the turnover threshold you fall you either either get the full benefit of the support or you don't get any support at all. Uh, so if you take the uh, uh, employment wage subsidy scheme, for example, the requirement for a 30% reduction in turnover, if you're on the wrong side of that, uh, then you don't get any support. So we do need to uh, consider introducing a level of uh, granularity and tiering to the manner in which those supports are brought forward, similarly in relation to uh, the CRIS scheme. Uh, and I think that the, that's the COVID restriction support scheme. So I think that as we move into the future phases, uh, I think it will involve uh, a degree of further sophistication in those supports, that it won't be an all or nothing uh, basis. 
that you will be gradually weaned off those supports uh, in line with the performance of your business. And uh, we're working through a range of different scenarios now uh, to try to bring that about. But it is in the period ahead. We've committed to maintaining the supports to the end of June. There'll be no cliff edge at that point. Uh, and well before the end of June, we'll signal what our plan is for quarter three uh, and beyond. A wider question on public expenditure from Dermot O'Leary of Good, Bu Good, Buddies, Good Body Stockbrokers. Uh, quote, as minister responsible, how do you ensure that the temporary spending measures introduced during the pandemic remain temporary and do not become permanent in the context of pressure for ministers to retain departmental spending levels over the coming years? That is going to be a key part of our work. And I would point to the way that we structured the budget. We uh, built a clear separation between core spending and COVID spending, and we allocated funding accordingly to different government departments. So there's very much a focus on core, which is the normal uh, budgetary allocations, uh, and then the COVID allocations, which are distinct and separate. Uh, and then, of course, we held back uh, the uh, five and a half billion or so in the context of the contingency fund and the recovery fund and that the deployment of those funds is very much in the context of COVID. Having said all of that, I don't for a moment um, underestimate the ability of uh, colleagues to make a case for the retention of all the crisis spending uh, in a non-crisis period. Um, but uh, in broad terms, the uh, additional spending that we have put in place for COVID uh, is for a COVID environment, uh, and we will have to revert to uh, uh, more normal levels of spending uh, over time uh, in line with the evolving public health situation. And I think the way that we have uh, structured the budget uh, and the way that uh, those additional expenditures have been conveyed to stakeholders, to the recipients and beneficiaries, uh, does make that ultimate separation easier, uh, but not easy nonetheless. Uh, so that is going to be a job of work uh, into the future. Uh, and uh, it's too early for that right now because we're still uh, in the pandemic. Uh, but we do have you know, an overall envelope this year uh, of the order of uh, 88 billion euro. And if you consider it going into last year, um, the expected expenditure was of the order of 70 billion, then it gives you just an overall sense of the impact of COVID. Uh, and so Dermot's question is, um, uh, is spot on. And that is going to be a key focus of uh, my department. And I think the way that we have structurally separated that spending in its presentation uh, is a very important uh, contribution to doing that. The General Secretary of the Trade Union Enforcer, Kevin callum -Ann, asks, quote, surely the crucial thing is that the country's specific recommendations for 2020 marked a major change from previous ones in the light of the pandemic experience pointing to the need to build resilience. Would the minister agree that we cannot simply go back to business as usual when we come through this? Irrespective of the fund, the 2020 um, country-specific recommendations could should surely remain priorities for government. Yes, I think that's uh, an excellent uh, question and a point made uh, by Kevin there. And, you know, I think that that particular country specific recommendation that he's referring to just underlines uh, in stark contrast the approach that the EU is advocating to this crisis compared to the financial crisis uh, of over a decade ago and the uh, decisions that have been made so far at European level uh, to uh, suspend in a temporary manner uh, the fiscal framework uh, to set out the overall strategy for continuing with fiscal supports uh, while the pandemic is here and until there is clear evidence of recovery, I think is a demonstration of uh, a change in the thinking. And of course, that is uh, most acutely underlined by the change uh, in the approach of the European Central Bank. So that is very much welcome, uh, though, of course, that will evolve over time uh, as we begin to see the pandemic uh, in the rearview mirror. But one of the uh, key recommendations there in the CSR that, that Kevin touched on is about building resilience uh, in our public health system. And that is very much aligned with government policy. Uh, that is why, you know, the a substantial portion of the increase in spending 
in 2021 is about building up capacity uh, in a permanent way in our public health system. That needed to be done anyway, but I would accept that COVID has underlined uh, the imperative of doing it. And so we do need to uh, increase bed capacity, um, both in our acute hospital system, critical care capacity, uh, and we need to ensure, of course, and it will always be a focus of this department, that we get value for money, uh, that additional money is accompanied by uh, reforms, uh, and that we deliver better outcomes. So we want to implement Slauncher Care, uh, building up resilience in our public health system is a key country-specific recommendation, which the government is absolutely committed uh, to implementing. Uh, and so I welcome uh, the broad change in the approach uh, at an EU level in in relation to continuing uh, with supports, but I, I, I don't for a moment assume uh, that that will continue indefinitely uh, because it won't. And that's why we need to have our house in order uh, and put in place the reforms so that we are getting better value for money, so that we are, for example, delivering infrastructure projects in a more efficient way uh, and that we are uh, reducing risk uh, of significant overruns. That's why, for example, uh, I have reformed the Project Ireland Delivery Board by bringing in more external people and there will be an open co competitive process for that. That's why I'm setting up a major projects advisory group as well uh, to help us deliver now on the ambitions uh, of the National Development Plan because we're putting a lot of money uh, behind the public capital investment program that is going to be at the heart of our recovery um, but accompanying that then has to be real reform uh, and uh, the drive to ensure we get value for money. A question from a uh, student Donald McKenney, um, your views on the EU Canada trade deal, uh, that's a specific one and coming back to the issue of other globalization matters, the move towards so-called strategic autonomy in the EU. Some of the smaller member states are a little skeptical about the, the idea and that it could be um, it could be of greater benefit to larger member states. Uh, do you have any thoughts on, on where that discussion on strategic autonomy is going and how it could impact Ireland? Sure. Well, first of all, in relation to the uh, CETA, uh, the Canada-Europe uh, Trade Agreement, uh, I very much support it. I mean, we are a country that is probably the single biggest beneficiary uh, of uh, an open trading environment. And we are a small economy uh, uh, operating uh, within uh, the global economy where we have performed incredibly well uh, in relation to international exports, even right through the pandemic. So uh, I think that the trade agreement offers significant potential uh, for Ireland to continue uh, to develop its business links, to develop its export markets. Uh, I am aware, of course, of the concerns that have been expressed, particularly around the uh, investor court uh, um, uh, instrument. Um, but I am satisfied, having looked at the detail of that, uh, that in overall terms, uh, this agreement is to Ireland's benefit. And I think it's something that we should embrace. We should be a country that is promoting uh, international trade, breaking down barriers, opening up new markets and strengthening existing markets uh, for Irish businesses. Uh, that is the cornerstone of Ireland's enterprise strategy. And I think we need to, to be seen uh, to be a strong advocate for uh, such international uh, trade agreements. Uh, in relation to the strategic autonomy issue across uh, the European Union. Um, I don't have any strong views on that, Dan. I think it's early days. It will take time to see where countries uh, wish to, to develop that. But while the European Union has rightly been the subject of some criticism in relation to the vaccination program uh, in the context of COVID, uh, I think the counterfactual is difficult to assess. Uh, if all individual countries, for example, had gone about uh, trying to strike individual deals uh, and advance purchase agreements with these global multinational uh, pharmaceutical companies. We really don't know what the outcome would be, and it is far from certain that the outcome uh, would have been better. And when I look at Ireland as a country now on this particular issue, having secured a, a supply pipeline of 18 and a half million doses of a range of different vaccines uh, with now supply 
coming uh, in quite a steady manner, uh, with the supply in quarter two being uh, three times higher than the supply in quarter one, then I think it underlines and shows the strength for a country like Ireland of being at the heart of the European Union. Uh, so the EU, I think, needs to do what it does in a better way. It needs to try to improve and continue to embrace reforms. Uh, but I don't think that individual countries going off, doing their own thing uh, and developing that further um, uh, is the way to go. We have a pretty clear delineation at the moment between national competencies and EU competencies. And I think the focus should be on uh, reforms improving the way decisions are made, having more accountability and transparency uh, in the way the European Union operates, uh, rather than giving you know, greater autonomy uh, to member states, particularly in areas where the EU has a lot of expertise. Because when you look at the, the global challenges that we're going to have to face, whether it be security, the migration crisis, um, cyber security, uh, and of course, uh, climate change, we have to be tackling those issues together. So for me, multilateralism, uh, the role of the European Union, uh, the strength of the collective of countries working together uh, is the best way to tackle all of those issues. Uh, and I think the uh, debate around strategic autonomy needs to be seen in that context. We don't want to be heading down the road of isolationism. Uh, the European Union project has been a fantastic project. It has been transformative for Ireland. And I think we should be leading the debate and the argument for uh, developing the union even further. Thanks very much. Minister, thanks. We've uh, hit 10 o'clock, uh, run out of time. Let me apologize to all the people whose questions I couldn't, we couldn't have time to get to you, but uh, uh, most importantly, thanks for taking you at the time to, to join us this morning, give, give us an hour of your time at a very busy time. It was uh, wide ranging and uh, frank, so we uh, thank you for that. Um, and leads me to simply wish you and everyone here today a, uh, a good rest of the day and uh, look forward to uh, seeing everyone soon, hopefully in person. Thanks again. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, everyone.